top of the morning to you. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Morning Light Broadcast. This is the Bible study where we go through our Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And uh, we've only been in it about two years and three months. And we've made our way to Job chapter 10. Hallelujah. We're absolutely making progress. Good morning, Cynthia. All of those listening that never do like to run into the chat box, which is great, because I'm kind of like uh, some, I like to do one thing at a time, and it helps me to focus if I'm not chatting a lot. <laughs> I just, I'm, I think that, what do you call that, an A-type personality, sweetie? Is that, um, or no? No, I don't <laughs> think so, but I get what you're talking about. Yeah, so. I love to focus on what I'm doing, so I give it my undivided attention. And you know who was like that? My mom. My mom had the same tendency, so that just works for us. So we're excited. It's Monday. It's a beautiful Monday. Even though it's cloudy here, it's a beautiful day because the sun, S-O-N, is shining in our hearts. We're anticipating a fun week this week with God. I tend to be a major multitasker. <laughs> I can talk on the phone, listen to the radio, watch TV. Type. Type something on the computer. Check my text, tweet, drink coffee, drink coffee, Facebook message, have a snack, <laughs> plan my day. Did I leave anything out? It's that's what multitaskers do, sweetheart. All in my head. That's just how I have always, always worked. Ben, I always said I wanted to get a like a cap or a t shirt or a plaque that said I'm not ignoring you, I'm multitasking. <laughs> Glory. Yep, so um, off and running, we trust you had a beautiful weekend, and God is good all the time to all of us. <laughs> I see those comments, glory. Today, we are studying Job chapter 10, and this is the second chapter of Job's reply to Bildad. Thus far in Job, we have... At the beginning of Job, we saw the curtain drawn back, and we saw events taking place that Job and his friends didn't know about when Satan goes to Job. And really what I think we saw was because Satan came among the sons of God. Yeah. And as the mouth of the accuser. And so I think we see in Job 1 and 2 what's happening in the heavens while the remainder of the chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5, or 3, 4, 5, and 6, are what was happening upon the earth. In other words, Job's having these problems, his friends show up, they're not very helpful. Well, what's happening in the heavens? Well, we saw that at the beginning. And then Ellie Paz, one of, uh, after sitting silent for seven days with their friend, Elipaz speaks up and he tells Job he thinks that he must be in sin to be suffering so. And, and uh, then Job replies to him and insists that, no, he's not in sin. And what kind of a friend are you to suggest that I am in sin? And then Bildad speaks up and reiterates, uh, not only is Job in sin, he he absolutely is convinced. He is absolutely an overt sin, not just secret sin. And, and then uh, Job replied in chapter 9. He continues his reply in the chapter today. And as I looked at it in the wee hours of the morning, up to 2 o'clock this morning, uh, the time change takes a little getting used to. And when I first opened it up and I looked at it, I kind of, excuse me, <coughs> I sighed and I thought, wow, here we go again. Job is complaining, he's downhearted, and I kind of had to brace myself to <laughs> uh, think about it, to, to apply myself to what I was reading. Excuse me, having to clear my throat today. And, <clears throat> and uh, as I looked at it, I realized that it's a good thing for us to study Job. It is absolutely a good thing. Because studying Job is going to sanitize our minds hmm. from any thought that God is behind suffering 
in our lives. Because we're going to look at Job, and the thing about Job is letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Job makes a statement about God. He says, God, you're accusing me. Well, is that correct? Satan's the accuser. He blames God for oppressing him. Is that correct? Uh, Satan is the oppressor. He blames God for coming after him like a roaring lion. Wasn't well, that interesting? Because the Bible plainly says, no, Satan is the roaring lion. <clears throat> Job thinks that God is, is setting him up for target practice. There's a couple of things. You know, people think we, we suffer because God is mad at us. We think we suffer because God wants to teach us something. We think we suffer because God wants to glorify himself in our, in our suffering. And but the in all those different ways of looking at suffering, the the one thing everybody agrees on is that God's doing it to him. Mm -hmm. And El Dad, I'm sorry, Bill Dad, Elipaz and Job and, and Zophar, who we haven't met yet, they they totally disagree with each other. Except for one thing. They all believe that God is sticking it to Job. Mm -hmm. And that's and it's like the Lord told me a long time ago. He said, it's not that they're not asking, uh, coming. Up, it's not they're not coming up with the right answers. They're not asking the right questions. If you want to, you can look at all the major doctrinal disagreements in Christianity. And the problem is not that they're all coming up with wrong answers. The problem is they're not asking the right questions. And it's the problem is not where they disagree. The problem is where they're agreeing. Mm -hmm. And if you see where two major schools of theology agree, you'll find the problem. <clears throat> wow. If you care, most people don't care to dig that deep. Most people could care less. They just, they, they take this, it's like a pseudo high road, pseudo sophisticated, uh, I'm more spiritual than, than that. But you know, the Bible says that the Bereans in the book of Acts, they were more noble than others. Other people would listen to Paul and they just decide they either liked him or they didn't. But the Bereans, they said, they went away and they searched the scriptures mm -hmm. to see if these things were so. Amen. There was a deeper quality about them that quite honestly gets disparaged in the world we live in today. Of, you know, a world of uh, pop culture spirituality where it's like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm not into doctrine. Well, doctrine doesn't save us. But yet doctrine shapes our thinking about spiritual things. Which, and where would we be without the uh, one of the five-fold ministries is the teacher. The teacher. And how, where would we be without our teachers that are uh, given that grace to dig into Well, scripture? and one of the four pillars of apostolic culture in the book of Acts is continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't even believe there are apostles. I found it very interesting wow. where Jesus, when he talked about apostles and prophets, he always put prophets first. He said, I, I will send them, he said, I will send prophets and apostles, just like his father sent John the Baptist and then Jesus. Jesus functioned as the apostle of our uh, faith. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist as a prophet was one that was the forerunner. The prophetic is a forerunner of the apostolic. And I saw several references in the New Testament this weekend where the, Jesus, when he talked about apostles and prophets, he actually mentioned prophets first. Not because they are first in priority, but because the prophets bring the apostolic ministry. Mm -hmm. There was a, and we'll, we'll spend just another minute talking about this and we'll start reading. Uh, there was a controversy in the 1970s about what they call the shepherding movement. And the shepherding movement had some excesses in it. Uh, leaders were supposedly telling people who to marry, what kind of car to buy, that kind of thing. And I'm sure some of that happened, but it didn't happen. Quite honestly, I didn't see any of that happen. I wasn't a part of it, but watching very closely at that time, the leaders of that movement, Don Basham, Ern Baxter, Derek Prince, and Bob Mumford, and one other I can't name right now. And, uh, but they uh, eventually, uh, the church rose up and there were many councils held, evangelical councils held widely across the, the Western world to, and they were rejecting what the shepherding movement stood for, mm -hmm. and what they their conclusion was, they came out and says everybody doesn't have to have a personal pastor. And I I thought about that, and Ephesians four says God gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers 
for the perfecting. perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we might grow up in him? Are we saying we don't need a pastor? If somebody came up and said, I don't need a pastor. I don't even believe in pastors. You know, there was a day in the church, in Martin Luther's day, being a pastor was as controversial as being a prophet is today. Mm -hmm. For you know, Back then they had a priest. And Martin Luther says, no, you need a pastor. Why would I need a pastor, they would say. They would had uh, 1,500 years getting along without pastors, for the most part, in the Middle Ages anyway. Right. A thousand years of history that they didn't need a pastor. Why do we need a pastor? And not only that, they were married. That was like sexual sin, to have a leader who was married in Martin Luther's time, to have a spiritual leader who was married, that was like sexual sin. That was like saying, uh, yes, uh, my pastor's, I need a past pastor that's an adulterer. Wow. <laughs> that was an ast as astounding. In those days, it was that astounding uh, for someone to suggest, not only do you need a pastor, but you need one that's married. That'd be like us saying, not only do you need a pastor, but you need one that committed adultery. Yes. <laughs> because of how they were taught, that they had to be celibate, not married. And... Uh, but uh, to, for people today to say, oh, I don't need a pastor, well, you might question their spirituality. And, uh, but then you, you suggest, who's your prophet? Make, take a step further. Who's your personal prophet? Personal prophecy involves a personal prophet. Mm -hmm. Who's the prophet in your life? Who's the apostle in your life? We need apostles. Mm -hmm. We need prophets. We are advocates for the prophetic, but the function of the prophetic is to be a forerunner for the apostolic. Uh, God has connected us with two key apostles that we really, it's our honor. We didn't plan it that way, but God uses us to promote two key apostles right here, at least regionally here in our area. Right. And they're very vetted, bona fide, unmistakable. Miracle uh, signs and miracle wonders. Miracle signs, guys. wonders, dead being raised, apostles. And, uh, but just something for you to, to think about. If, if we need to have a pastor, and we do, and our pastor has our personal pastor, uh, we, our, we should have a personal prophet. Mm -hmm. We should have a personal apostle. Uh, it's not always the same one all the time. Uh, we, sometimes we grow into other, under other influences, or God moves us, or things change. But who's your pastor? I know, and you know, and I realize I get that. That's a little, that's kind of pushing the point. But the pendulum swings it's so far the other way. Yeah, though. <laughs> for for decades upon decades upon decades, people have been rolling their eyes at the idea of an apostle, rolling their eyes at the idea of a prophet. Now God's wanting the pendulum to swing the other way, and it always it tends to go out into a, a an extreme to some degree in order to make the correction an extreme in the other way. So who's your pastor? Who's your prophet? Who's your apostle? We need to answer those questions. I think it's vitally important because God's raising up an apostolic culture in our day. And again, what's the point? Why should I have an apostle? Because you're supposed to continue in the apostle's doctrine. If you don't know who your apostle is, then how can you continue in his doctrine? And that's different from what you're going to hear on Christian radio. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Job 10. Was it necessary for Job to suffer? In this chapter, Job insists that God is plaguing him unfairly. Job's friends, on the other hand, insist that Job is in sin. Otherwise, he would not be going through all this trouble. So which is correct? Is Job a righteous man being tested by God? Or is he in sin and being punished by God? Is this God or the devil? Or is there another place from where Job's vulnerability to suffer originates that could suggest that none of what he went through was even necessary? <laughs> <coughs> 22 verses. Yeah, what if he had not feared? What if he yeah. So Job 10, verses 1 through 7 to begin with. 1 through 7. <clears throat> my soul is weary of my life, and I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I say unto God, Do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Is it good unto thee that thou shouldest oppress, that thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands, and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as man seest? As, are, as thy days are, I'm sorry, as... Are I know thy, another yeah. scripture, so that's throwing me. Are thy days as the days of man? Are thy years as man's days? 
that thou inquirest after mine iniquity and after searchest after my sin. Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thy hand. Interesting. He says, wow. says, are your days as the days of man? In other words, he's saying to him, you're so much more powerful than I, and so and omnipotent. How dare you hold me to an accountability? <laughs> yeah, that's really the way people think today. You know, people that struggle, people that don't have resources, they look at... Uh, People that do have resources or wealth or power, and they say, how dare you hold me into accountability? Look at how I'm suffering. How dare you? Mm -hmm. Well, when you're God, what, what makes you think? Because the fact that you're God, in Job's eyes, disqualifies God from holding him to a level of accountability. And he uses the term, he says, you're condemning me, you're oppressing me, you're contending with me. You're contending with me, you're condemning me, you're oppressing me. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it about Job's thinking? That he thinks God is doing this to him. Does God condemn? No, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Does God oppress? No, he doesn't. Never. Does God contend? No, he doesn't. God is not the contender. That's right. See, in the previous chapter, and in this chapter, Job is continuing to answer Bildad. Bildad, in his remarks, echoes the criticism of Job. And the insistence that Job must be in sin, in Bildad's view... Uh, the suffering of Job is at God's hand, and therefore Job must have done something to provoke God's anger and is being justly punished. And some people read that and they think, well, of course, uh, uh, there is a such thing as just punishment. Otherwise, repentance cannot come. I have two questions for you. Number one is, are you volunteering? Look, I've seen these prophets that stalk the aisles and preachers that get up and stomp on toes and rail on people. Of course, they always rail on people that are not in the congregation. Uh, and, uh, and people say, yes, that's good repentance preaching. No, it isn't. Because Romans 2, 4 tells us that the goodness of God leads men to repent. Why is the world so unrepenting? Repentant. Is the world so unrepentant? Because of the day we live in and the recalcitrance of, of humanity shaking the fist in the face of God? Or is the world so unrepentant because we have not preached the gospel? Come on now. Romans 2.4. Yes, people have to repent. How do you repent? <clears throat> Romans 2.4. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repent. Give people God's goodness and they will repent. Give them something else. They're not going to repent. And if you're motivated, and I see people get giddy. Congregations give standing ovations when preachers preach all of this vitriol, this bile that they call their gospel, ripping people, eviscerating people. I remember one time I heard a, a name, a household name preacher getting up railing on dads who do, don't pay child support, which is a thing dads shouldn't do. Uh, but by the time he got done doing it, I was sitting there thinking, if I was a dad, in that position, separated from my kids, not paying my child support, guilty or no, I think I'd want to go kill myself. It was terrible. It was horrible. And the congregation was standing up, sure. standing ovation. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, that's not going to cause one single deadbeat dad to repent. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, a lot, of, a lot of dads we call deadbeat dads are in situations where, you know, it's hard enough to provide uh, one income, let alone two. And I'm not saying dads shouldn't support their kids. They absolutely sure. should, even if they're not with them. But uh, that's a struggle. That's something you have to be mentored out of in order to be mentored into a place as someone in that position where you can not only provide for yourself, but provide a double income. How would you like to have to be told by the courts to produce a double income? It's like bricks with no straw. And and the system <laughs> makes it very difficult. Right. And, and I'm not excusing. I'm just saying look at it from a human standpoint. They don't need to get beat down. They need somebody to love them, give them the goodness of God, teach them how to prosper, teach them how to be givers, teach them how to believe God for more. And then maybe won't, they won't need the courts to tell them uh, they need to support their children. Maybe they'll start doubling the check that the court requires of them mm -hmm. instead of ripping them to pieces. Mm -hmm. See, point. Job is exhausted. In this chapter, again, Job expresses his exhaustion. He has suffered a great loss and his body is ravaged with boils and he's lost his kids and his business and his flocks and his wife said curse God and die and uh, in and why did she say that because that was in Job's thinking 
Curses come up. Job sacrificed every day because he was afraid his kids would curse God. His wife, when they're under pressure, oh, just curse God. Why was that coming up? Why is it, did, did Job's children invent cursing? Did Job's wife invent the idea of cursing? I'll guarantee you there was something in that household mm -hmm. that, that that subject of cursing and fear. Right. And she was simply echoing something that existed in the little ecosystem that represented their world. And I'm not saying Job was cursing God because the Bible plainly says he did not. But you have to read between the lines. Look at it as a counselor at the situation. If you were talking to someone in that situation. And the point is not to do like Bill, Dad, Ellie, Paz, and Zophar and just rip him to pieces. Because that, that's not going to help anybody. But you can't deal with people according to their problem. You have to deal with them according to their need. I might say too back earlier in the chapters we read that uh, Job said himself that he prayed daily because he feared. He prayed daily, and he prayed that his children wouldn't curse God. So his wife was, you know, you're washing your wife with the wrong water of the word. That's the word of cursing. He prayed it out loud every day. Every single day. So that's where she picked it up, and that started with the head of the household. Huh? So he, in verse 2, Job said he, he addresses not the men who are with him pointing the finger, but he, he, Job's talking to God in this passage. He asks God not to condemn him. He asks God, show me what I have done to provoke such terrible suffering, which Job, in agreement with his friends, believes his suffering originates with God as well. If you read what the commentators say about this book, you will find they also agree with Job, Bildad, Elipaz, and Zophar that it is God plaguing Job. Of all the contention in the book itself and in the views of various scholars about this book, the majority seem to agree on this. Whatever the reason Job is suffering, it is God doing it to him. Let's talk about that. First of all, is God mad at Job? I'm glad that you asked. In Job chapter 1 verse 8, we see that is not true. In this verse, when Satan challenges God concerning Job, the father describes him as an upright man, even a perfect man who fears God and declines to do evil. So whatever Bildad and Job's other friends may believe, we know that from the perspective of the divine narrative, God is not mad at Job. Right. What, whatever's going on, God is not mad at Job. What can we learn from this? Just because someone is suffering does not mean they are suffering because of wrongdoing mm -hmm. in the eyes of God. When you go through a trial, what's the first thing you ask? When you're under pressure, it's very natural to get introspective, but you better be careful because you will put yourself on a uh, rabbit uh, trail. You will put yourself chasing off, finding something that you convince yourself and others will agree. Just ask somebody, do you think mm -hmm. God's doing this to me because of... Don't ask. And they'll say, yes, and not only that, I'll give you 10 other things why I think he's doing it to you Dear too. Jesus. See, we tend to get introspective. See... But, uh, and it's natural for us to ask when we're under pressure, what did I do wrong? But the fact is that the fact that you are suffering is no indication that you have done anything wrong, but neither is the conclusion then God's doing it to me. Right. See, we live in a fallen world. Can you get that? We live in a fallen world. The world we live in is a battlefield, spiritually speaking, and there are many factors that come into consideration regarding the origin of human suffering. Because the whole idea that God is, is putting suffering in your life to punish you or to love you or to teach you, the whole idea that God would do that is say he's putting it in to punish you, which means good things happen because he's rewarding your religious performance. Or he's putting suffering in your life to teach you, which means that, that the other side of that is when you're not suffering, it's because you know it all. Or he puts, it in your, he puts suffering in your life because he loves you, which means if you're not suffering, maybe he doesn't love you so much. You see how wrong that thinking is when you follow, when you follow it out? People quote Job all the time. And the people that quote Job claiming that God caused Job to suffer because he loved him have never read the book of Job. They've never paid attention to what it says. When Job uses he also says God is 
contending. Job asks God, please explain why are you contending with me? Job and his friends agree that it is God doing this. Is this true? When Job uses the word contention to describe God's posture toward him, he's describing God as an opponent and an adversary. Is this true? Is God the adversary? The word adversary is equivalent to the word Satan. Or is the devil the adversary? Why do, what do we see God doing? What do we see God doing in the book of Job? They're accusing God of doing this, but the only thing we see God doing in the book of Job is putting a hedge around him, undeserved, an undeserved hedge, because Satan came after Job because he saw that Job was vulnerable, but he encountered something he did not expect, a hedge put by God that was not justified because Job was full of fear, which his fear authorized Satan to attack him. And so uh, when Satan challenges God and calls on God to harm Job, uh, God's reply in verse 12, Job uh, chapter 1, is to point out that Job was already in Satan's hand, which is why God was protecting him. Why was Job in Satan's hand? Because Job 33, I'm sorry, Job 3, 25, shows that Job is confessing fear. In fact, he says the thing that he greatly feared came upon him. So in verse 3 of our chapter, chapter 10 here, Job says it is God oppressing him. Is this true? Is God the oppressor? In verse 6, he accuses God of putting him through these sufferings in order to find something wrong with him. In other words, God squeezing him to see what if he can make him do wrong. Is that true? Does God do that? Does God put pressure on you just to see what you'll do? Is God oppressing Job? No. We have shown in the paragraph above that this is not true. Is God testing Job to see if he will sin? James wrote that God does not do this. James 1.13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Amen. He doesn't have any in him. So God was not testing Job either. In thinking that God is tempting him, Job reveals his view of God. Job's view of God contradicts what James says. God, God doesn't do that. But his idea of God is that is exact. He believes God oppresses. He believes God contends. He believes God puts the squeeze on him. He believes God is tempting him. He believes God is pursuing him to harm him. He believes God uh, will abuse the righteous along with the unrighteous. He thinks it's unjust. He thinks he should be justified because he thinks he's a good guy. He sees God as having a predilection to condemn man rather than to love man. When in fact God was putting an inexplicable and from Satan's standpoint an unjust protection around Job when Satan knew according to how things worked at that time that he had every right to assault Job but the hedge that was around him kept him from doing so. God was doing exactly the opposite of what Job was thinking he was doing. In verse 7 Job insists that he knows that God knows he is not in sin. He says God you know I'm not in sin and you know I'm not wicked. <laughs> However, Job continues, even though God knows he is a just man, Job continues uh, telling God, you're brutalizing me anyway, unfairly, and that therefore I have no escape. I have no escape. You're God. You're bigger than I am. You can, you can uh, use me for target practice if you want to. Verse 8 through 14. Somebody called it last week, stinking thinking. <laughs> oh, um, 8 through what again? 14. Babe? Okay. Verse 8, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as clay, and wilt thou bring me into the dust again? Hast thou not poured me out as milk and curdled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me, clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation has preserved my spirit. And these things hast thou hid in thine heart. I know that this is with thee. If I sin, then thou markest me, and thou wilt not acquit me from mine iniquity. Now, is that true? That he thinks God will not forgive him. Is that true? Is there no forgiveness in God? There was forgiveness in God back then. They would uh, take the life of a sacrificial animal looking forward to the cross, sure. just like we exercise faith looking back to the cross. There was forgiveness in God, but he, his idea of God is God does not forgive. 
And don't we get that today? We get that same thinking today. Uh, we think we expect God to forgive all of our sins and piccadillies, uh, piccadillos and, and all of that. But when it comes to somebody else, God's going to judge that situation. Mm -hmm. Are you volunteering? Don't put your mouth on that. In verse 8, Job acknowledges God has made him and fashioned him, but he doesn't understand why then is God working to destroy him. He doesn't question his, okay, God made me. Maybe he's not trying to destroy me. No, he has a foregone conclusion. Yeah. God is trying to destroy him, and it confuses him because he knows God made him. And as you've said before, no mention of Satan anywhere. And of course he says, <laughs> yeah, you're trying to destroy me, God. But notice the exaggeration. Is Job destroyed? Is he destroyed now? He suffered loss. Mm -hmm. But is he destroyed? No, he's not. Is God working to destroy him? No. Who is the destroyer? Mm -hmm. Satan. Many people would argue with this, and they quote many scriptures where they see God raining down just destruction upon hapless victims. However, remember the following verse. You need to listen to this. Luke 9.56. Next time you think, God made somebody you disagree with or think is a bad guy have an accident, die of cancer, mm -hmm. die before their time, suffer some something. Next time you see something like that happening in someone's life before you decide whether God did it or not because he's trying to teach them something, he's punishing them, uh, or he's trying to get glory to himself, it, uh, all of those murky reasons why God might do that, Notice what Jesus said, Luke 9, 56. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Amen. And so if someone's being destroyed or you're being destroyed, it's not God doing it. Otherwise, God is doing something to you that is outside of Christ. God is doing something to you that has nothing to do with Jesus. And so now we have a whole nother religion that rejects Jesus. Because Jesus is not into destroying. When Jesus came, the purposes of God, henceforward, were constrained within the limits of his character. He plainly says it is not his will to destroy. So if you are going through something destructive, it is not God doing it. When you, if you see, and that doesn't mean that God isn't involved, because he was involved in what was happening to Job, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. If you're going through something destructive, it is not God doing it. If you see someone else suffering, even if you think they're suffering for rejecting Christ or committing evil, it is not God doing it, which doesn't mean God is not involved. From the day that Jesus was born, God has done nothing outside of Christ. And Jesus states plainly that he is not the destroyer. We talked about that in chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God spoke in times past through the prophets and through the law, but now has spoken through his Son, whom he's made heir of the world. What that means is the life of Jesus is an interpretive lens through which we must filter our entire understanding of the Bible. Did Jesus ever uh, have 50 Pharisees consumed with fire in front of him because they didn't like his preaching? No, that, that happened with Elijah. Elijah did that. Uh, uh, 50 people came up, wanted to take him to see the king. Fire came down and destroyed him. He did that three times. And you can go through the Bible and find much upheaval, death, fire rained down, all kinds of killing, suffering. But the Bible says this. Yes, God was speaking in the time past through the law and the prophets, Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. But now he's speaking through his son. So we have to take filter our understanding of who God is today through the character of Jesus. When Jesus walked the earth, did he ever look at somebody and snap his fingers and make somebody die? Did he ever lay hands on anybody and impart suffering to teach them something, to love them deeper, to glorify himself, uh, or to punish them? No, he didn't. He never did any of it. You will never find. You have to go to someone other than Jesus to get dead people, to find poverty, to find suffering. You have to go through another channel other than Jesus. But it is Jesus through whom God is speaking. Jesus is the lens. His life is the lens through which we filter our understanding of God. And if we think that we find some other biblical character through which we can justify God doing that to someone or to you personally for some esoteric reason, punishment, teaching you something, glorifying himself, then you are rejected. You are, that understanding exists outside of Christ. 
And we can only conclude that you are either deceived, misled, you've got bad teaching, and you need a deeper understanding of who Jesus is if you have to uh, uh, come up with these esoteric religious thinking about suffering. That's where I would say you need a spiritual enema. Well, Get somebody, rid of the waste. while we've been doing Job, somebody said, I had a covenant cut over me in my own blood when I was two years old that I would suffer for Jesus the rest of my life. Jesus. And I said, I'm sorry. Sorry for your luck. You're suggesting that your blood mm. has more value than the blood, your blood that uh, validates your suffering has more value than the blood of Jesus that no validates way. your deliverance? There's only one person's blood. And of course, people lean into this thing about suffering because they want to, they have compassion upon the hurting. Well, where do your fidelities lie? I know it's, it seems hard. But where do your fidelities lie? With the person that's suffering and not understanding or with the God that sent his son to die in order to alleviate that suffering? Amen. Well, I have to answer them. That is the mind demanding, standing up, sitting in the place where only Jesus belongs, saying, you got to give me answers. I remember I preached a funeral of a young man who was killed in a shooting accident. He was 14 years old. He went to my church. His mother went to my church. Uh, it was a Catholic community. Uh, and... Uh, they had 300 people in the church, 300 people outside the church. The casket was in front of the, the, the pulpit. The Catholic uh, priest was there to do his part for the father as well. And I watched, sat for an hour in a packed house as mother after mother after mother came up to that casket of that dead boy. And every one of them, it's God's will. It's God's will. It's God's will. It's God's will. And I just sat there, and when I got up, I knew how the mother believed. The mother didn't think it was God's will. And I got up, and I said one thing I know, after I introduced myself. and I said, one thing I know about this tragedy, it is not God's will. Amen. And the mother in the gallery, weeping, her eyes puffy, closed shut, she said, that's right. God did not kill my son. Amen. How, just, just amazing. Job goes on to... Uh, Ask God to remember. God, remember, I'm just flesh and blood. He suggests that God is overlooking his frailty as a mere man. Is that true? Is God ignoring the humanity of Job? Hebrews 4.15 tells us that God is touched through Christ with the feeling of our infirmities. That in Christ, God has been through everything you've been through and more. In Exodus 26, we see that he shows mercy and loving kindness to thousands that love him. In both the Old and New Testament, God consistently is seen as a merciful God who is mindful of our limitations. Therefore, in fact, God has not forgotten Job's human frailty. It is not God putting Job through this. Job placed himself through unreasoning fear. Now listen. Job placed himself through unreasoning fear in a place of vulnerability that attracted Satan to him. The only thing we see God doing is lifting the hedge off of Job. Not because he's mad at him, but because of Job's persistent fear that eventually places himself in a position that God would have had to violate his own character to continue to protect him from the fear that Job would not let go of. Do I need to say that to you again? The only thing we see God doing is lifting the hedge off of Job, not because he's mad at Job, but because Job's persistent fear See, the fear of the Lord is clean. Everything else is unclean. Job was courting an unclean spirit in his home. God's not mad at Job, but because of Job's persistent fear, that eventually places God in a position that we, he would have had to violate his own character to continue protecting Job from the fear that he refused to let go of. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear is a spirit. Job's fear, and you look it up, it means his terror, the terror, the great terror that he thought one of his kids would curse God and die, did not come from God. But yet it was a consistent everyday part of his life, his personality, and Job's character. And his vocabulary. And his vocabulary. The fear that Job had concerning the destruction of his family did not come from God. Job entertained ungodly fear. He was a worrier. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> Worry consumed him. Yeah. Are you a worrier? 
Are you worried about what might happen? Are you worried about your kids? Worried about your health? Worried about your finances? Worry, 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 worry. I used to be a tremendous worrier. And then one day, I it's like the way I picture it in my vision, I was like God was taking me somewhere, like he put me in an airplane, the pilots bailed out, jettisoned the fuel, and threw out all the parachutes, and God invited me to step out into a free fall and believe I would land on my feet and God would take care of me. Amen. And I had no choice. I'm either going to love God. I'm either going to trust God. So Amen. I pitched myself out at 30,000 feet, <laughs> tumbling through a situation and a circumstance. And when I got to the bottom, I was unharmed. And not only that, there was a little something there next to me. Five foot two, eyes of blue. <laughs> Thank you, honey bunny. So Revelation 21.8 says that fear is a sin and not some unchangeable psychological defect. See, we feel sorry for people when they fear, as though it's an unchangeable psychological defect. But yet, we need to change our mind about this. Revelation 21.8 says fear is a sin. There are eight categories of sin listed in Revelation 21.8, and the very first one is fear. Mm -hmm. Why is fear a sin? because it challenges the understanding of the love of God and suggests that God cannot be trusted. Therefore, because Job allowed this fear to continue day by day, and eventually, in spite of all that God did to bless Job and to prove his goodness, consequences eventually resulted. Not because God was being unreasonable, but because Job chose to be unwilling, in fact, to see himself as unable to eliminate the fear in his life. Now, why was Job unable to remove fear in his life? Well, how about you? Are you a worrier? Do you fear problems? Are you always waiting for the other shoe to drop? Is this an attack of the enemy causing you to fear, or is it something you are responsible for? Are you responsible for fear in your life? Or is it like baldness, you know, male pattern baldness, I can't help it, uh, you know, I don't want to go to the hair club for men. I don't want to wear a toupee. Uh, I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to get that spray on thing. You spray paint your my head every day. You know. I, I don't want to do that. Uh, I just accept it. This is something that I cannot change. Fear is different. Is fear? What about fear? The Bible says the fearful are the first ones into the lake of fire. Ouch. Okay. What if it said and those with cancer will be the first ones into the lake of fire? No, it doesn't say that because they had no control over that. But the fearful, and from God's standpoint, from God's way of thinking, fear is something you have something to do, do with. You are responsible for fear in your life. Quit thinking like a victim. Amen. Refused, and I know people, they have unreasoning fear. They cannot, uh, they, they have to be behind the wheel of a car. They cannot ride as a passenger in anyone's car. I know people that can't get outside their house. I know mm -hmm. people with all kinds of phobias and fears. And, oh, I can't help it. Yeah, well, you know what's happened? You have allowed fear to the point that the enemy's come in with a demon and he's buttressed that fear. Mm -hmm. Dominating. He, he has augmented that fear spiritually and now he won't let you up. But I guarantee you, if you ask God to trace it back, if we believe, you're just not feeling sorry for me. I, I do feel sorry for you. I hurt for you. But I don't hurt for you so much, I'm going to ignore what this book says. Well, pity. That's the way it's been done for decades. Right. Oh, we'll understand it better by and by. God took that baby because he knew that one day that baby would turn away from God. You know why a pastor or leader would say that? Is because they're trying to justify the person and make them think that somehow God did this so that they could alleviate their suffering. They're more, they have more affinity for that hurting person than they do for the God they're called to serve. You don't have to uh, abominate God's word and impeach his character in order to give comfort to the suffering. Mm -hmm. No way. So what, what, was, what, what should we do? See, should we feel sorry for others because they're in fear? Should we feel sorry for ourselves, or do we take responsibility? Do we take responsibility? Do we tell the fearful to take responsibility? Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. He said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Most people know nothing about bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're not, we don't teach discipline. We're so interested in filling the church pews that we will not discipline people. We will not bring people into discipline. 
We see ourselves, I'm not the pastor, I'm the senior facilitator. Garbage. Mm -hmm. You're a papa. And go out there and mentor those people. And if they can't be mentored by you, then let them leave and find somebody they will believe in and they will allow to mentor them. Uh, else you are leading them down the primrose path to destruction because they're not being taught how to have discipline and grow up in God. Amen. In the Bible, you will find 365 fear not statements. One for every day of the year. <laughs> this is obviously then something that we can do something about. Something that Job could have done something about, but didn't deal with. God is not plaguing Job. God is not mad at Job. God is not persecuting an innocent Job. Job has sown thoughts of fear that he did not deal with properly, and he's therefore suffering unnecessarily. All the while God is loving him. All the while God is trying to help him. Mm -hmm. Read verse 15 through the end of the chapter, please. Okay. If I be wicked, woe unto me, and if I be righteous, yet I will not lift up my head. I am full of confusion. Hello. <laughs> Where there's confusion, there's every evil work. Therefore see thou mine affliction, for it increases. Thou huntest me as a fierce lion, and again thou showest thyself marvelous upon me. Thou renewest my witness against me, and increasest thine in indignation upon me. Changes and war are against me. Wherefore thou hast brought me forth out of the womb. Uh, thou, yeah, thou hast brought me forth out of the womb. That's the question. Oh, that I might, that, that I had given up the ghost and no eye had seen me. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone that I will make, uh, take comfort a little. Where before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death, the land of darkness as darkness itself, and the shadow of death without any order, and where the light is as darkness. This is God, just leave me alone so I can have some comfort. Do you uh -huh. see, he has a wrong idea about God because God is the comforter. And he was anticipating going down to the grave. God, I just want to die. Just leave me be. Let me die in peace. God is our peace. Amen. People say that, that, that Job suffered because God wanted to glorify himself in him. Job totally misunderstood God. It isn't that he didn't love God. I believe he did love God. But he had something in his life that was skewing his perspective. In verse 15, Job declares he's confused about the whole ordeal. In verse 16, he tells God, God, you are hunting me like a fierce lion who will not relinquish the prey. Is that who God is? Is God hunting Job like a lion? Yep. Is there anyone that does enter into our life such a way? Peter, no doubt, realize Peter knew the book of Job. Peter, no doubt, was thinking of the book of Job when he penned these words. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walked about seeking whom he may devour. So Job was thinking God was being a ravening lion destroying his life when in actuality that's what the devil does. See, what is Job doing? Listen now. Job thinks God is the lion seeking whom he may devour, which we know that Satan is. So what is Job doing? Now listen to me very carefully. He's attributing the works of the devil to God. Sure. This is very nearly the classic definition of blasphemy. Blasphemy is attributing the works of God to the devil. Blasphemy is attributing the works of the God to the devil. When someone says speaking in tongues is of the devil, that's saying that something that is of God is of the devil. That's blasphemy. That's a very dangerous thing to do. People get by with it because they do it in ignorance. And then the two weeks later, they're talking in tongues. And, uh, <laughs> but this is the opposite of that, but just as egregious. Blasphemy is attributing the works of God to the devil, but this is attributing the works of the devil to God. Job comes very close to this, as do we all, when we see the work of the devil and we say that God is doing it. Is God the roaring lion preying upon the sons of men? No. This is the work of the devil. It is the devil that is tormenting Job, and unfortunately Job and his friends all think without pause that is the presumptive agreement between them. It's the only thing they do agree upon is God's doing this to Job. There is at this point in Job no indication that they even believe the devil exists, much less that it is he that is harming Job because of Job's failure to deal with fear, unreasoning fear in his own life. 
See, even people that don't believe in miracles, go read the writings of people that don't believe in miracles. They will always take note when someone who does believe in miracles die and dies, and they will say God killed him. Every time someone who doesn't believe in miracles, doesn't believe in tongues, doesn't believe in the full gospel, every time someone dies who does believe that, they will get up and say, God did that. So it's not that they don't believe in divine intervention. They just don't believe in divine intervention that benefits man. They only believe in divine intervention that destroys man. So they are attributing the works of the devil to God. You see the hypocrisy of the cessationist doctrine. Oh, God, that's all passed away. But then when somebody who doesn't believe that tongues, miracles, and so forth have not passed away, dies of a sickness, they'll say God did that to them. So they do believe in miracles. They just believe in the reverse. They believe in the miracles that destroy man rather than believe in the miracles. And do you see how, how, does that not make you want to be nauseous? <laughs> uh, in verse 17, Job declares, God is bringing witnesses against him as a prosecutor. Is God doing this? Is God the accuser or is the devil the accuser? I mean, folks, we have 42 chapters of this. I hope you're in for it. <laughs> We're already in I mean, I had to make a decision this morning as I studied this. Do, do we want to do this for 42 chapters? We've got to do it. It's like, okay, we're just going to have to get down and do it. And God put 42 chapters of this in the Bible so that we could, so he could, so that he could justify, so that he could defend his own character. Amen. Because he knew how man would embrace this doctrine of death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is God the accuser or is the devil? Job concludes his remarks by wishing for death and describing the world around him as without order and in complete chaos. Is the world around Job in chaos? No. Job is in control. You know, Virgil Johnson. Virgil said, Virgil said uh, and here I'm a writer now, but Virgil made a joke. He, he said, he's a great apostle, he's gone to heaven now. He said, you know a man's ministry is over when he writes his book. <laughs> he went on to say, he said, the guy writes a book about how Jesus is coming back or the world's coming to an end and all this negative stuff. He said, the world's not coming to an end, just your ministry. In other words, they're seeing the end. So, right. hello, I thought about that and Virgil knew a whole lot more about that than I did. I'm glad you have 50 books still inside <laughs> you that we haven't crafted yet. Job, uh, <laughs> Virgil. Uh, Job concludes his remark. He wishes for death. His world is in chaos. Is his world in chaos? No. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean God isn't in control. There is a, when it looks chaotic, all that means is God is working according to an order that you don't have the instrumentation or the intellect to measure. You know, they used to think the world ascended out of chaos. They called that chaos theory. Then whenever 20 years later, they had more sophisticated mathematical models to measure bigger patterns than they had before when they said it was all chaos. Mm -hmm. They discovered fractals. They discovered a level of order that was infinite in its organizing power, and they realized it is it that the world arose out of chaos? It's just we didn't have the instrumentation or the intellect at that time to measure the order that was in place. So God's ways are not our ways. When things look like you are spiraling out of control, it simply means that our mind is not God's mind. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. And he's working according to an order that at that moment we cannot measure. And if we will learn to think with his thoughts, make decisions at the pace that he gives us the overture by instructing us through the prophets, instructing us through the still small voice, then you begin to make decisions that will cause you to live your life at the pace that God lives his life and the enemy who's setting an ambush for you every single day can't keep up with you. What if Satan turning around saying, I'm going to go get Job and God whispers to Job, hey Job, Start making some decisions real quick with me. And the enemy sets up at Job's house, but Job's nowhere to be found because Job is making decisions faster than the enemy can foil them. Mm -hmm. Because he's cognating at the pace that God cognates simply. See, God, you can't think as fast as God, but you can make decisions as fast as God gives you the directions. And you, why? Because you're not explaining, expecting God to explain himself to you every time he tells you to do something. But if you demand God to explain himself before you'll obey, then you have to slow down and the devil thinks faster than you do and he will foil you every time. But if you need, learn to say, God, you don't have to explain yourself to me. I will comply. And would you mind explaining later? 
He said, later, make the decision now. I don't understand it, but it seems to be working. Everything I do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it. And the devil's in my rear view mirror trying to keep up and he can't. He's having to pull over at the gas station. I got a full tank. I'm outpacing him and everything that, that I do. And God, this is really working really great. Uh, would you mind explaining it to me? He says, I will uh, later on. Mm -hmm. Who's with me? That's right. <laughs> God's in control. But yet Job made himself vulnerable by unreasoning fear. And I don't think to suggest he had unreasoning fear and worry does violence to the text, does violence to what God said about Job, because Job could, it's what, it's what God says about Job and what Job says about himself. God loved Job. Job loved God. But there was something there that made him vulnerable. And we're going to continue to study this as we go along. We're going to hear from Zophar tomorrow. Oh, <coughs> oh joy, huh? Well, glory to God. You know, what it makes me want to do is just jump up and shout how good God is. And I'm thinking of that song. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God. Every word, every praise. Just think, just begin to confess how good God is. If you are at work, if you are at rest, just God, we just honor you. And we thank you for this day. And we thank you that you are supreme above all other gods, that there is no other God like you. There's no one who compares with you. No one has a right righteous and um, bears their holy and righteous arm as you do. No one has ever been able to measure up to you, Father God. We're exalting you today. We're saying you are a very good God and you have only goodness in your heart. And we exalt and magnify your name. We pray that your name would be amplified in the earth, O oh God, that people would become come to know you as you are, that God is love. And there wouldn't be any exceptions, Father God, to the fact that God is love and God is good. And we we praise you and we thank you, Father, for your healing virtue and your kindness, your love, your grace, your patience, your long suffering. You are a very good God. Every word of worship today is to our God, that we would never compare you to one who is dark, the one who is the opposite of you, Father God. There's no comparison. He can't hold a candle to you, Father God. You are a supernatural, ever living God, and you ever live, and you're making intercession for us, Jesus, and we are praising you today. We are worshiping you because that's who we are. That's what we do. Every word of worship is to our God.